My address this evening will take the Cambrians back to the world of our distant ancestors, where caves and their past inhabitants once lurked. I shall explain how our knowledge and understanding of the Welsh Paleolithic has transformed over the past centuries, and I will explain the places our Welsh caves hold in this ever-changing story by bringing you up to date with some new work and new thinking that is transforming our picture of this period. It's to the credit of several past presidents, including Professor Sir William Boyd Dawkins and many other 19th century researchers, to whom we owe so much of our knowledge of the many caves in Wales. The science of caves originally put such studies very firmly in the remit of geologists, and it was only later that the work was picked up by archaeologists who went on to study the material cultural evidence and lives of the people who once inhabited them. Caves are dark, mysterious places to many of those who venture out to visit them. Visitors tend to approach them with a sense of trepidation, not knowing what they may find lurking within them in the darkness that they offer. Because of this mystery, and also because caves are natural traps for environmental, climate and human evidence of times in the past, they've also been of considerable interest to geologists and to archaeologists for many centuries. Stone tools are central to the story too, and they feature heavily in my own research. Indeed, stone tools were first mentioned in the literature as far back as in Pliny and in Varro. During medieval times, they were called Seronia or thunderstones. A 16th century quotation by Ulisse Aldrovandi provides a contemporary interpretation about how these thunderstones were formed. They are apparently due to an admixture of a certain exhalation of thunder and lightning with metallic matter, chiefly in dark clouds, which is coagulated by the circumfused moisture and conglutinated into a mass, rather like flour with water, and subsequently indurated by heat like a brick. Stone tools were prized and were often kept in collectors' cabinets of curiosity. Amongst these were glossopetri, which were fossilised teeth. This Neolithic axe head is such an example. It's part of the National Museum's collection and is accompanied by a fascinating note which reads that there can scarcely exist a doubt of its being a tooth of the lesser cachalot or spermaceti whale, from its perfect accordance in many particulars, in size and form and structure. This letter, dated 1828, suggests these identifications were still being made quite late on. But despite these late references, it was actually during the 16th century that Michele McCarty, director of the Vatican Botanical Garden, became the first person to recognise that stone tools are not naturally produced, but were manufactured by humans. Stone tools were few at this time. This tool, a hand axe, was discovered in the 1690s by John Conyers, it was found with animal teeth and bones from a site on Gray's Inn Lane in London. Conyers is credited with being amongst the first in Britain to recognise the tool for what it was, that it was humanly made. There were other antiquarians who came to the same conclusion during the 18th century. They included Robert Plott and Edward Lloyd, who both actively collected stone tools for the Ashmolean Museum's collection. In Wales, the first references I have found to stone tools come from caves at Kevin in Denbyshire. This rock arch was just above the River Elwy near St Asaph and was the route of the main road from Denby to St Asaph until construction of a new road in the 1830s. This rock arch contains a cave, the old or lower Kevin cave, which was described in the 16th century by Leland, whose record this is. He is known to have visited in the 1530s, and the rocks he mentions are interpreted as Kevin rocks, with their caves contained within them. Thomas Pennant also undertook a tour of North Wales between 1778 and 1783, and he would also have travelled along this road through the arch. 
Pennant was clearly aware of the significance of the Elwe Valley, which he described as traveling among long, most romantic dingles, varied with meadows, woods, and cavernous rocks. Neither is it destitute of antiquities. These writings all highlight the romantic setting of the caves, but unfortunately, they don't tell us much about their content. Many others will also have visited and written about the caves too. The first antiquarian investigation at Kevin Caves is supplied by Richard Fenton, who in 1808 described investigating the Lower Kevin Cave, where he recorded the stratigraphy and found small mammal bones, along with some cut antlers and charcoal. At this early date, we know that the idea of human antiquity was not understood, and the only chronologies available were those written ones, and most used the Bible as their source. So the idea that people could have been on Earth much earlier than this was not easily accepted. But the first inklings were starting to be observed. In Britain in 1797, John Freer published a discovery of a hand axe found at Hoxton in Kent with associated animal bones. I find his discovery and report interesting in that no one remarked upon it, despite him describing it as coming from a very remote time. Elsewhere at Kent's Cavern in Torquay in Devon in the 1820s, Father John McHenry was digging and finding artefacts associated with animal bones. He drafted a book in which he noted his observation, but which he didn't publish. Why he didn't publish? may have been due in part to the influence of William Buckland, professor of geology at Oxford University, to whom he sent his manuscript. Buckland is believed to have urged caution in asserting that these finds were undisturbed, leaving McHenry to abandon his work. But at Paviland Cave Gower, Buckland was involved with the early discovery of what has become known as the Red Lady of Paviland. The skeleton discovered in the cave in 1823 was found by Lady Mary Cole and Miss Talbot of Penrice Castle, along with John Traherne and Lewis Weston Dilwyn of Swansea. In his publication, this drawing of the cave showing the skeleton beside a mammoth skull, he described the Red Lady as that of a Roman contemporary with the Iron Age camp on the hill above. His explanation for the presence of ivory artefacts was that they were carved from older material washed into the cave by the flood. We'll return to the Red Lady a little later in this address. Buckland's ideas were based on the mosaic deluge at this time. He saw the biblical floods evidence on the earth through the presence of water-worn rocks and pebbles. The presence of animals that he thought came later. Buckland influenced others, particularly Father John McHenry, whose findings at Kent's Cavern he dismissed by arguing that the ancient Britons who occupied the cave after the development of a stalagmite layer had dug ovens through the stalagmite and introduced the stone tools that way. McHenry maintained, though, that the tools predated the stalagmite floor, but he didn't dissent in print from Buckland's theory. This all led to much interest in Welsh caves. And one of these caves was Kevin, which was visited by many people whose names are well known to us today. In 1831, a young Charles Darwin traveled to North Wales to meet Professor Adam Sedgwick to help him undertake research into the older rocks of Wales as part of his project to produce a treatise on all the rocks of Great Britain below the old red sandstone. Sedgwick and Darwin left Shrewsbury together on Friday the 5th of August 1831 for Llangollen, and the next day they went north towards St Asaph and Abergele. Darwin's notes described the limestone and he recorded finding rhinoceros bones in the mud in the cavern. Sedgwick mentions finding a rhinoceros tooth. Unfortunately, neither of them described the significance of their finds. But the tour was important in that Darwin undertook it just before he decided to join the expedition on the Beagle that became such a landmark journey for him and indeed for us for science. 
Darwin returned from his expedition to publish his On the Origin of Species in 1859, which then led towards some of the modern ideas about the antiquity of people. Back in Kent's Cavern in 1859, well, William Pengelly was championing Father John McHenry's work by publishing McHenry's manuscript. Pengelly went on to conduct his own excavations at Windmill Hill Cave at Brixham and also later at Kent's Cavern, confirming McHenry's findings for himself. But it took a visit from the archaeologist John Evans and geologist Joseph Presswich to Abbeville in France, where a customs officer named Jack Boucher de Pert had found stone tools and associated extinct animal bones um, that, to confirm their contemporaneity. The concept of human antiquity really began to be established from 1859, therefore a pivotal year in that we see many theories formed and come together. In some writers' minds, it is this year they give the start date for the use of the term prehistory. And the idea of human antiquity was accepted fairly rapidly in some scientific circles, not least because of these eminent scientists being behind the theory. But how well accepted were such theories amongst the general populace? The acceptance of human antiquity was not perhaps as sudden as we might be led to believe if we read some of the contemporary literature rather than the modern interpretations of it. And I say this because of an event that's recorded in the Times newspaper on the 20th of October 1870, claiming the existence of a strange amphibian living in the depths of Kevin Cave. The Flintshire Observer, two weeks later, records a living lizard, four feet seven in length and very like a crocodile, that had emerged from the depths of Kevin Cave. This lizard had emerged and was slain by a valiant Welshman, Mr Thomas Hughes, at chimney sweep from Rill. The idea of such extinct creatures surviving in the cave was clearly causing some incredulity around the area at this time. And it might seem to hint that people were still convincible that such creatures were not yet extinct. Until, of course, you learn that Mr Hughes, our chimney sweep, had purchased the crocodile from a travelling menagerie when it died in Rill. Having purchased it, he proceeded to sell tickets to see the marvellous lizard of Kevin, which he had placed in the cave. Pont Newydd Cave also lies in the Elwy Valley at Cavan and was first recorded in a paper published by the Reverend Stanley about his excavations in Cavan Cave back in 1833. Whilst Stanley worked in Cavan Cave, a new road was being cut along the valley side from Cavan Village at the top of the ridge to Pont Newydd in the valley bottom. During these works, a new cave, now known to us as Pont Newydd Cave, was spotted higher up the valley than Cavan Cave uh, was beside this road. It was completely undisturbed, and Stanley noted that it offered great potential for new discoveries to be made, although he himself didn't actually investigate it. Professor Sir William Boyd Dawkins was one of the first to investigate Pont Cave in 1872, working with Mrs. Williams Wynne and the Reverend Thomas, the Vicar of Cavan. Boyd Dawkins recorded finding cave and grizzly bear bones. In 1874, Thomas McKenney Hughes joined Reverend Thomas in further excavations and his section drawing through the cave shows the extent of the removal of deposits by Boyd Dawkins. They also recorded finding crude stone tools, animal bones, and most interestingly, a human tooth. The human tooth was sent with the other bones to George Busk, an anatomist in London, who observed that it looked as ancient as the bones which he recorded as being hyena, cave bear, horse, mux, rhinoceros, red deer, wolf and fox. He also noted that the human tooth was a very large size and exceeded any with which he compared it. 
Unfortunately, despite considerable effort on my part to try to track this tooth down, its location remains unknown today. But that it was human, I think, is not to be doubted. As the 20th century began, a detail of an understanding of the sequence of the Ice Ages emerged, and geologists' attention turned away from North Wales towards the Alps, leaving Welsh caves largely untouched for some time. During the Second World War, things began to change when Pontnewydd Cave was requisitioned for war use. The floor was levelled, duckboards were placed on the floor, and a stone wall was built. Inside is this guard chamber that once contained a coke stove and separated the guard from the depth charges and landmines stored inside the cave. Apart from some minor exploration by cavers in the 1960s, no further disturbance of the deposits took place in the caves until 1978, when the museum commenced its excavations. I had the privilege of being mentored by the late Professor Stephen Oldhouse Green, and it was Stephen's project that resulted in the remarkable discovery of some of the earliest Neanderthal fossils from the world. Stephen's legacy was to put Wales on the map as a go-to place for studying early Neanderthals and improving our understanding of their presence and lives. One of the first discoveries was this tooth, deemed by Professor Chris Stringer of the Natural History Museum to be an evolutionary early form of a Neanderthal, which matches the description very closely of McKenny Hughes' find. It's fair to say that it is the discovery of hominin teeth in the cave that makes Pont Newydd the important site that it is today. The 17 Neanderthal teeth discovered during the excavations have undergone really detailed study by Tim Compton and Chris Stringer in London. They have drawn many interesting parallels between the evolutionary early Neanderthals at Pont Newydd with early hominins found on other sites, in particular the Cima de los Huesos in Atapuerca in Spain and the site of Cropina in Croatia. The study tells us that the 17 hominin teeth represent a minimum of five individuals with age estimates based on known Neanderthal development criteria as an eight and a half year old, a nine year old, an 11 to 11 and a half year old, a young adult aged between 14 and 16 and one mature adult. They suggest that just one of these, the nine year old was female. These Neanderthals lived around 230,000 years ago. Study included microscopic analysis of each of the teeth from which they were able to determine evidence for these people's lives and activities. This very heavily worn tooth shows um, wear features caused by a diet with a lot of tough fibrous foods within it. There is evidence that they use their teeth for purposes other than for chewing. This tooth shows that a hard um, object, possibly a bone, was held between the teeth for some considerable time, perhaps whilst it was being used or worked on. And two of the, evidence, of the teeth show evidence uh, for cut marks, suggesting that these people adopted the cut and stuff method of eating, perhaps holding something, a piece of meat um, in their teeth, uh, whilst cutting it using a stone tool and then eating it. Grooves caused by heavy chewing occur on 11 of the teeth, but only one tooth has a deposit of dental calculus. This tooth shows hyperplasia, which is indicative of disease or starvation at a time when the teeth were forming. This is one of four teeth to display this feature. And since Stephen's work, genetics and genomics have been moving apace. Ancient DNA analyses and studies of human and faunal material continue to shed light on population mobility. Attempts were fairly recently made by the um, recently announced Nobel Prize winner Svante Pablo of the Max Planck Institute in Germany to extract DNA from one of these teeth from the young child. Unfortunately, though, it doesn't appear to have preserved. 
We had to rely upon evidence, though, from other early Neanderthals elsewhere in the world to recreate our model for the displays at St. Fagans. And now that ancient DNA is being recovered from soils and sediments, potential now exists to extract and to analyse this from Paleolithic hominin sites, such as at Pont Newith Cave, or to caves of early Upper Paleolithic age where we don't have the human fossils surviving themselves. And indeed, this technique has successfully been undertaken recently at Denisova Cave in Siberia. Zoo archaeology by mass spectrometry, otherwise known as zooms, is also a comparatively quick and cheap technique which extracts collagen or other proteins from tiny bone samples to determine the species from which the bone derives. During recent lockdowns, this was trialled on 638 of the many thousands of indeterminate bone fragments that were recovered from the debris flow deposits at Pont Newith Cave, as a trial undertaken by Oxford University student Dawn Lewis, then supervised by Professor Tom Hyam and Dr Katerina Duca. I can report that no new Neanderthal fossils were recovered from this trial, although two previously unrecorded small mammals were identified, and the study demonstrated the potential is there for future success. Because one of the main areas of interest is why we only have teeth surviving from this cave, this technique might help us to bring, light, bring to light Neanderthal bone fragments, which might be able to be analysed to generate more data, including potential for DNA. For example, another field of study is proteomics, which provides the ability to extract individual proteins from bone, tooth or preserved food remains to determine information about past diets and disease. The extraction of specific isotopes, too, has potential to provide more information about population mobility in both early humans and the animals that were once their food. As well as the hominin teeth, Pont Newith Cave has generated an assemblage of over a thousand stone tools, including Ashurlian style hand axes made of volcanic rocks that would have been available locally. These rocks are predominantly rhyolite, ignimbrite and volcanic tufts. Lavalois cores and flakes were the product of a napping technique typically used by Neanderthals, and the tools themselves are fairly simple in form. They're basic cutting tools or knives. We have a range of bones from animals which lived at the same time as these Neanderthals. Species include cave bear, wolf, fox, narrow-nosed and merck's rhinoceros, roe deer, red deer, a leopard-like cat, lion, horse, beaver, water vole, and Norway and narrow-skulled voles too. Just two of these bones, though, demonstrate that interrelationship between people and animals, as only two of these bones preserved cut marks and give those hints at what the Neanderthals might have got up to in this cave. This horse tibia uh, here shows evidence that it was filleted for its meat, whilst this bone shows that bears were skinned for their, for their skins, presumably for use as clothing or to have been made into shelter. Many of the animal bones are very highly fragmented, having been churned around in the debris flows with limestone clasts. An intensive sieving program at the site has revealed microfauna, including the various Norway lemming and various other voles, that suggest a deteriorating climate and open landscape at the time these Neanderthals were present. The fact that Neanderthals, their tools and associated animal bones have all preserved at all is really remarkable given the fact that there have been two major ice advances that have covered much of Wales since the Neanderthals lived here. Deposits washed into the cave, and so there are no living floors. 
all the deposits were churned up as part of debris flow events that took place at various times, but the main one being in what we call marine isotope stage 7, which took place around 230,000 years ago, when these deposits washed into the cave and plugged the cave entrance. As a result, most of the fossil remains that have been recovered by the excavations have come from the lower bratches, uh, this deposit here. And these uh, underlie a remnant uh, stalagmite floor and silt uh, deposits with uh, later material deposited above. It's the dating, though, of this remnant stalagmite floor and of thermoluminescence dating of deposits and burnt flints from the layers below that give us the age for this site. A much later last glacial or Devensian event in marine isotope stage 3 brought an early glacial faunal assemblage into the cave, but no associated human evidence when the deposits were breached again by meltwaters and debris flow events. And axes have been found in various places, including in southeast Wales, where about 10 have so far been found as chance finds. Four of these come from Sudbrook, where they eroded out of the older river gravel deposits. But unfortunately, none of these has a secure context. This one on screen, however, is a fine flint hand axe found eroded out of the cliffs at Rossilli on Gower. It's hard to say with any certainty how old it is, but it would not be unlikely to be 200,000 or so years in age. During construction of the Second Southern Crossing or Prince of Wales Bridge, the excavations beneath one of the piers recovered these tools. We have here a small water rolled hand axe on the right and a blade both made of flint uh, here on the left. The blade has many similarities with the tools found at Pont Newydd, and it's a technology made by Neanderthals known as the Levalwa technique. This hints at Neanderthals having been present in the area, but were they passing through or did they have a campsite here? We haven't yet found sufficient evidence to be able to answer these questions. Moving further west, a uh, campsite is recorded at Coigan Cave near Larne in Carmarthenshire, where these two hand axes were found. They were deliberately placed together against the cave wall, as if their owner intended to return to use them again. These hand axes are very different in form to those from Pont Newydd. These are known as boot coupé and are associated with sites where fully evolved Neanderthals are found. These were certainly present across South Wales. At Coigan Cave, there is associated evidence for hyenas, including their coprolites, which provide us with environmental evidence such as pollen, as well as details of what these creatures once ate. We also have the bone remains of the meals that the hyena consumed. Here, a woolly rhinoceros bone was crunched up by a hyena's powerful jaws. These species would have made use of the cave and were contemporary with the Neanderthals, but the evidence for the Neanderthals is just so slight with just this handful of stone tools. Coigan Cave was excavated many times, and the most recent being during the late 1950s, where, uh, where the evidence from Charles McBurney's work in the cave uh, was uh, recovered. And this was published by uh, Stephen Oldhouse Green many years later. The gap between Pont Newydd Cave's use 230,000 years ago and Coigan Cave is vast. But in this time, there was another interglacial during which we believe there were no people in the British Isles, the land having become an island where before people were able to re enter the country. So what we find at Coigan Cave are very late Neanderthals, dating somewhere between 65 and 34,000 years ago. Wales has evidence for other very late Neanderthals too, and recent research has looked at some of the stone tools recovered historically in the late 19th century from a number of caves, including Longhole on Gower, 
Phnom Beno in Denbyshire and Paviland Cave on Gower. Study of the stone tools and animal bones from all these sites has resulted in an improved understanding of the presence of blade leaf points, which seem to indicate in Neanderthal makers as opposed to fully anatomically modern humans. Dr. Rob Dinnis of Aberdeen University's work at Phnom Beno in Denbyshire has sought to obtain the context for the blade leaf point that was recovered from this cave by Dr. Henry Hicks in the 19th century. This artifact, now associated with the very unsnappily named Lincomian Ramissian Jews Manabitian, or LRJ as we tend to call it, is now believed to date to between 38 and 36,000 years ago. Blade leaf points were also recovered from Pavland Cave, which is a site of some significance given its long history of use during the Paleolithic. An intensely cold period immediately after this date may have seen the abandonment of Britain during this period. Scientific and mathematical approaches have added to the tools available to us to investigate sites, their dating, geology and their finds, which can help us to understand the people who lived during the Paleolithic periods in Wales. We can connect the human evidence to the science and also in particular to climate change data, resulting in a vast improvement in the precision of our understanding of the early Upper Paleolithic, when modern humans first appear. We now have tighter chronologies with far fewer anomalies amongst the results that help the new overarching picture of human activity at this time to emerge. Over the past 30 or so years, there have been concerted efforts to, made to unpick the assemblage from Paveland Cave. It's this cave, perhaps, more than any other in Wales, where our interpretations have really changed. The cave, as already mentioned, was first excavated in 1823 when the Red Lady skeleton was uncovered. It also underwent fuller excavations by Professor William Solace of Oxford in 1912, along with lots of smaller explorations in between and subsequently. Stephen Oldhouse Green undertook study in the cave in 1997, but despite finding pockets of undisturbed deposit, was unable to materially add to an understanding of the upper Paleolithic human uses of the cave, owing to the deposits that did survive largely being much older in age. So assessments of the various artefacts recovered from the cave from the historic excavations have been studied typologically and scientifically. From the various studies undertaken and the application of new dating techniques, we see a new chronology emerging for this important site. Along with the late Neanderthal use of the cave, evidenced by the blade leaf points, we also see stone tools of Aurignacian age, dating around 34,000 years ago. These include Buran busques, or blades of flint from which smaller microblades have been detached, uh, struck uh, from uh, both uh, sides of the uh, point here. These have also been recovered from Fenumbeno, and we have one shown here from late 19th century work at Horlesmouth Cave near Tenby II. Modern humans first made their appearance in Europe well over 50,000 years ago, and in Britain they were found at Kent's Cavern in Torquay over 45,000 years ago. The Red Lady of Paveland Cave was one of the first modern humans to be afforded a rich burial around 32,000 years ago. The Neanderthals are believed to have died out between, before 30,000 years ago, but would have coexisted with the modern humans in Wales and across Europe before this time. The skeleton known as the Red Lady of Paveland Cave has its own fascinating story. Letters and accounts of the discovery and early theories survive in the National Museum's Geology Archive. Initially, Buckland thought they had discovered a customs man overcome by smugglers and buried in the cave. But over dinner later that same day, the theory changed. And in reports of a lecture Buckland gave in Oxford just a few days later, the skeleton had become a female witch 
or Red Lady even, they thought, a Roman prostitute associated with the camp on the hilltop above the cave. A Red Lady because the bones are stained red with ochre in the grave, where ivory bracelets and shell beads were also found. It wasn't until the early 20th century that the gender was correctly determined as male rather than female, based on the study of the pelvic bone. The skeleton survives in the Oxford University Museum of Natural History, which is where Buckland took it following the discovery. The bones have now undergone major study. The first attempts to date the Red Lady took place in the 1960s, when an early radiocarbon date of 18,000 years ago was obtained. This date was seen to be interesting, as it was right at the heart of the last glacial period, so it would have been extremely cold in Britain at this time. And so, um, and surprisingly, it's been found to be erroneous and subsequent dating has gradually pushed the dating further back in time to the more reasonable time of 32,000 years ago. In 1996, full study of the Red Lady was undertaken by Professor Eric Trinkhouse, who was able to tell us that the skeleton is that of a male aged between 25 to 30 at death. He was approximately five foot seven inches in height and weighed 11 and a half stones. His DNA was deemed to be standard and dietary analysis suggested his diet was based on meat, but 10 to 20 percent possibly came from a marine resource. There was little evidence yet, many plants. We don't know how he died but we do know he was placed carefully in his grave around 32,000 years ago. He is amongst the oldest rich burials of modern humans found in Europe. He is considered to be of a Gravettian age. He isn't the oldest and he isn't the only one, as other skeletons at Dolny Vestenice in the Czech Republic, Sungir in Russia and burials at the Grimaldi Caves in Italy are very similar. At Grimaldi, the skeleton had his head placed on a slab that was covered in ochre. At Paviland, the red ochre that gives him his name suggests he was buried in a shallow grave with ochre that might have been sprinkled onto his body, as shown in this museum reconstruction, or it was used as preservative in his clothing. The exact method of transfer onto the bones remains a bit of a mystery to us. Other items recovered from the grave include mammoth ivory rods, a pendant, bracelets, shell beads, and three bone tools of unknown purpose. The one on the left was part of the Penn Rice collection until it was donated to the National Museum in 1915, whereas the other two are both in the collection of the Royal Institution of South Wales, now Swansea Museum. At the time, the Red Lady was alive. The landscape would have been completely different to that with which we are familiar today. And rather than looking out onto the sea, the cave would have opened onto a wide plain full of horse, deer and other game that provided him with his food. This truly is an exceptional find. At Cattle Cave at Park Mill on Gower, we also have hints of a late Gravettian human presence, of slightly later date than the burial within Paviland Cave. At both sites, stone tools known as Font Robert points came from excavations in the caves. These were recovered from Cattle Cave Gower by Colonel Wood in the 1860s and from more recent work in the 1950s by Professor Charles McBurney of Cambridge University. These date to a time just slightly more recent than the burial of the Red Lady. In 2012, I had the opportunity to excavate in Cattle Cave ahead of grilling the cave. I recorded a pre-last glacial fauna, but I was unable to obtain sufficient material or evidence to connect the dating of human use of the cave or being able to pinpoint it in the standing section that survives in the cave. This was a time of deteriorating climate and by around 23,000 years ago, the British climate became too cold to sustain all but the hardiest of species. And by the last glacial maximum, around 18,000 years ago, all but the southernmost areas of the UK were covered by ice. 
Gradually, as the ice retreated, the vegetation re-established itself and animals were able to follow. These plants and animals provided the food required to sustain human life. And so, as the climate improved, humans returned to Britain. It's this time the late glacial or upper Paleolithic period, which commenced around 14,000 years ago until the climate deteriorated again some 2,000 years later that I'm going to end uh, my talk this evening with. Caves were ideal places for these hunter-gatherers to shelter and to live in. In Wales, we have a wealth of carboniferous limestone peppered with naturally formed caves, and many of them were used at some stage during the late glacial period. Amongst some of the more significant sites are Hoyle's Mouth near Tembe, where one of the largest assemblages of late glacial stone tools so far found in Britain has been recorded. Most of the finds are in the collection of Tembe Museum and can be seen in the displays there as this cave was extensively excavated during the 19th century from 1840 onwards by people including Colonel Jervis, the Reverends Smith and Winwood, as well as Edward Laws, who worked there in the 1880s. In the 1960s, Dr Hubert Savory of the National Museum first conducted excavations for the museum in the cave, which were published in Archaeologia Cambrensis. Much of the deposit was already removed and the extensive cave passage was excavated to bedrock in places. In the furthest depths of the cave, a graffiti on the wall tells us that people had reached the end of the cave by 1817. Stephen Oldhouse Green was asked to undertake some further work in the cave in 1984. This work took the deposits across the entrance down as far as bedrock and over three excavation se seasons Trenches were placed in each of the main cave chambers and the main passage, which extends back some 30 metres. Results indicate that this cave was used early on in the late glacial, when people first returned to Wales. As well as radiocarbon dates on animal bones, there are a number of stone tools of distinctive forms amongst the tool assemblage. This earlier period of the late glacial is dominated by the blade technology introduced by the modern humans. Blades or pieces of flint of long thin form were struck from prismatic shaped cores of flint or other fine grained rocks. During the earlier part of the late glacial, cores were very carefully prepared in order to detach fine blades but were often fashioned to provide greater control when detaching the blades and to ensure that they were as long as the core would permit. This faceting leaves a distinct characteristic on the finished tools known by its French name of talon or nepron, which is unique to the period around 14,000 years ago. Other contemporary key tools are cheddar points, deliberately shaped by obliquely truncating the blade at both ends to give this distinctive trapezoidal uh, shape and named after the site which has generated a quantity of such tools. These distinctive tools were multi-purpose with a steeply retouched backing to them, which enabled them to be held and used, but which also made them suitable for hafting into wooden or antler hafts, making them knives and hunting tools. The one shown on screen comes from Nana's cave on Caldy Island. Other forms of backed blade tools can be found and another form previously called a Creswell or convex backed point can also be found at Horsemouth Nana's cave and at other early last glacial sites. Another characteristic tool is the long blade end scraper. And these are often made on fine blades which have a convex profile to them, the very end being modified into a, into a neat uh, scraping tool. All these tools show these features have been found in Hoyle's Mouth Cave, along with plenty of stone tool napping waste, but not all the sites with such tools are caves. And in recent years, the number of open air sites known about across Wales has increased considerably. In part, I attribute this to the increase in flint collecting that is taking place, but also to the increase in recording that's been happening through the Portable Antiquities Scheme. 
In 2004, one such new site was reported to the Portable Antiquity Scheme by Mr. Peter Bond. Pete found worked flint tools whilst flint collecting on fields belonging to Cophill Farm at Howick, just west of Chepstow. Amongst the finds he brought to show Mark Lodwick and I was this tool, a distinctive piercing tool that I was able to recognise as dating to the Lake Glacial. I'm only aware of these pierces from two other sites, um, Hoyle's Mouth and Carden Park Rock Shelter in Cheshire. We undertook several field walks and each time the fields um, have been ploughed um, to eventually conclude that there is a con concentration of early Lake Glacial stone tools in one of the fields. The second concentration up here is of slightly uh, later date. Other tools recovered include this composite tool. At one end, it's a scraper, um, whilst at the other, it's a burin. Show them here with the stop. Burins are quite strong points which could be used for engraving or for scoring or even piercing some materials. They are simply made, as this one is, by striking a blow from the end of the blade um, just on, on the side here. The piece detached from making a burin is known as a spool, and these have also been found on the fields. They indicate that they must be making these tools at Cop Hill. The location of this site is interesting, as the field lies on a sloping field above the mountain brook that today flows into the River Severn at St. Pierre Pill. If we think about the landscape around 14,000 years ago, it would have been very different from that with which we are familiar today. The estuary would not have existed and the river itself would have been much smaller and further away. It's only since the melting of all the ice and glaciers that the sea level has risen to reach today's level. So 14,000 years ago, Britain was joined to mainland Europe and the landscape was open step. Finds from King Arthur's Cave, Herefordshire, which was studied in the 1950s by Arthur App Simon, and again during the 1990s by Professor Nick Barton. Um, their work has generated significant new finds, including modified horse teeth and other cut-marked bones, which have all been dated. The finds are identical to those at Cheddar and to those at Cophill and Hoylesmouth too. They include cheddar points, long blade end scrapers, and other tools typical of this early part of the Lake Glacial. Horse meat would have been particularly important to people's diets. It's rich and nutritious, and their diets were probably supplemented by saiga antelope, some red deer and mammoth. The evidence suggests that in this low la open landscape, it would be best to use spears and darts when hunting, and that the settlements were based in specific places from where bands of hunters went out to hunt for food, returning periodically with their kill. But it is caves that remain the most important to us for the interpretation of the later part of the Lake Glacial. Caves preserve animal bones, and therefore, there's a better chance of being able to date these sites. Priory Farm Cave, Pembroke, is one such. As well as this, we have sites on Caldy Island where excavations have recovered penknife points. These penknife points, uh, shown here, are of slightly later date to the cheddar points. One was found at Cop Hill, and we believe that this later technology was created by people hunting deer at a time when the woodland was denser and the landscape required more use of water and river valleys for movements. Amongst other sites with this technology are Potter's Cave and Ogovarachan, which were excavated between 1955 and the late 1980s by Brother James van Nederveld, one of the monks of Caldy. The finds from Ogovarachan include fine end scrapers, a backed blade with an impact fracture on it, and penknife points. I'm certain that in time, once more work is done on the finds we have from Caldy Island, which hasn't yet been undertaken, we could find that there are interesting animal bones that can be dated, which might also help us to shed more light on this site. Analyses of assemblages of historic finds have been taking place recently, 
Dr. Rhiannon Stevens of University College London and the Up North research team has visited um, the late glacial, faunal and human assemblages from several Welsh caves. Their work has included Lynx Cave near Llanarmon and Yarl in Denbyshire, which was excavated by Mr. John Bloor over a 50 year period. The assemblage, now in the National Museum, has a good number of cut marked bones, which indicate that direct connection between an animal and a person using a stone tool. Identifying such bones for dating and analysis is a time consuming task, and yet it's essential research given the paucity of such direct dating evidence that we have available to us. Cathole Cave on Gower is also an interesting place. In 2012, Dr. George Nash found an engraving in the cave, the dating of which is still slightly contentious, but is in all probability late last glacial in age, based on two uranium series dates on the flowstone that covered the engraving. The cave was grilled and that gave the opportunity for me to conduct the small scale excavation within the cave. George's work suggests that this might be a very stylized engraving of a red deer. Um, you see here the head and the body, possible antlers going off here, and um, some very stylized legs down here, and a cross hatching um, pattern over the body here. Deer were clearly a really important element of people's diets and lives during the late glacial period when the landscape was much more densely forested. And it's interesting that the evidence for art in Wales at this time is so slim. I might expect there to be more than we have, but given the effects of the last ice age, meltwaters from the glaciers and freeze thought typically from the cold stadial periods, any traces of pigment that survive will be very faint. We do have one significant find from Kendrick's cave on the Grey Torn. This is a horse jewel with several chevron decoration covering its surface, dating to a time around 13,000 years ago. One thought is that it might have been suspended as a necklace or possibly placed within a burial. It comes from Kendrick's cave, most likely the lower cave, which Thomas Kendrick used as a workshop for polishing stones to sell as souvenirs. Several perforated deer and bobbed teeth, tallies and the jewel have all been radiocarbon dated and there's a range of dates generated suggesting that the teeth might be slightly younger than the horse bone and tallies. We should remember that they are very close links to the continent in the form of the land bridge throughout much of the time I've been talking about. And we find that we have sudden hiatus or gap in the evidence for human presence immediately after this time. This isn't surprising as a sudden late, very cold period or stadial known as the Younger Dryas suddenly began. And for a period of around a thousand years, these late glacial people, people seem to have left Britain. During this time, glaciers developed again across the higher uplands of Wales, and evidence suggests that the winter ice lay just off Pembrokeshire uh, coastline. So around 12,890 years ago, Britain was plunged back into the cold of the Ice Age once more, and people moved south to the continent. So to conclude, since the 19th century, right through to the present day, Welsh caves have been important to our understanding of the Paleolithic human activity. In the 19th century, the caves started out helping to understand some of the geological phenomena and the antiquity of humans themselves. It was the discovery of the Neanderthals in Pont Newydd Cave by Thomas McKenney Hughes and Stephen Oldhouse Green's recognition of these for what they truly were that really, I think, has put Wales very firmly on the map of Paleolithic places to study. Throughout the past 40 years in particular, we've seen a real flourishing of study and research, which has run hand in hand with new developments in science. This relationship between the archeology span and the science has really enhanced our understanding of people's lives in the past. We're now able to take very small samples of bone to obtain radiocarbon dates, which have remarkably tight error margins. 
Increasingly, we can analyze people's diets and their DNA, the genetic makeup of these individuals and the animals on which they were reliant for their food. Each of these elements needs to be added together into the bigger picture, not only with the humans, their stone tools, the bones with which they interacted by leaving their cut marks and other features on them, but also the associated remains of some of the animals and the faunal and floral remains that may survive in deposits too. Linked to this is evidence for past climate change preserved in deep sea ice that frames these people's activities. So over this time, we have really come to be able to pinpoint far more accurately in time some of the changes and developments in the lives of the Paleolithic people who once lived in Wales and who I believe have now emerged from the darkness of these caves. Thank you very much for your attention.